Okay, I think I want to get started because there's a, a lot of slides to go through. Uh, I'm Howard and here with Indrik we're going to talk about a new bevel node that I've been working on. So this is a completely new from scratch bevel. I didn't just wrap the old bevel code. Uh, there's a reason why, several reasons why it's completely no code and a lot of this talk is going to be about that. But as a teaser, here's the main thing that got me going on Bevel V2 as we're calling it. Any of you who've used Bevel before, I'm certain have run into this problem that if you Bevel something like a character with serifs on it, pretty soon you get a mess on the right. Um, in detail what happens is here, because you've got a lot of really close points together on the edges of the serif, they soon overlap. Once they've overlapped, you get overlapping triangles, sometimes reverse triangles. It's a big mess that really is unusable in a render. You, you kind of have to fix it by hand. Normally, there's this clamp overlap thing that stops you from going too far, but sometimes I really want to go further, right? So how do you deal with that? What we're working on will fix this problem. Because this is what we really want. We really want the edges, when they meet, not to start overlapping, but to merge into a vertex and then another line to continue from that point onward. There's an algorithm called the straight skeleton algorithm that we've long known would do this, but it's hard to implement correctly and, uh, and it's hard to implement in, inside of a, a bevel, but we've been doing this work. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this whole slide, but this is mainly to let you know that there's a lot of work that's gone into bevel over 10 years of me working on this. And, and Hans worked on it for a while too. There's currently about 9,000 lines of code that is dense and hard to understand in C. It's kind of scary for anybody else to try to contribute to this code. So that was another big motivation. Let's rewrite this in C++, use modern data structures, split it into files somewhat, and uh, hopefully end up with something that we can then extend and maintain better into the future. So here are the goals of this Bevel V2 project. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at the specifications. What does Bevel actually mean? Which turns out to be surprisingly hard, and a lot of this talk is just going to be about that. <laughs> um, write it in C++, as I said before. And then because it's a node, we can give a lot more control on the inputs to users. We can, you know, right now there's this hacky way of saying, I want these edges between two nodes of a, of a vertex map to be beveled, which doesn't always work. Um, now with a bevel node, you can actually directly select the, the edges that will get beveled. And we also want to give control over each of the widths of the four corners of an edge. Um, I mean, internally, it'll actually be a different control that that's, uh, doesn't have redundancy, but something like that. So you'll be able to get um, edges that taper inwards on the bevel and things like effects like that. Uh, also, the output, all of the different parts of the bevel will be available as outputs so that you can use them in further nodes to do things like you know, set the material the way you want or whatever you want to do with those, those th things. There's some algorithms that we want to improve. Uh, Henrik initially came to me on, working on bevel because he was annoyed by the curve continuity that we'll get to later. Uh, and so we want to fix that. Uh, I've been continually annoyed about how hard UV handling is and I want to really do it a completely different algorithm. And uh, there's a bunch of special cases in the code right now, like cube corners are handled completely separately from other things. The big new feature is this overlap merge handling that I talked about. But also, because the same problem of that collision and overlapping happens when you do a face inset, uh, the same code will fix that. And so there will be a, a face mode uh, as well as an edge and vertex mode in, in the bevel node that will do a face inset. Uh, Henrik and I have been arguing over whether this is actually should be a separate node called face inset or whether you know, people would naturally regard this as a face bevel. We'd like some feedback on that particular point. Uh, and then so there's some performance things. The old code loops over the whole mesh in lots of places. And I kept that for backward compatibility rather than improving. But now starting from scratch, I don't have to do that. And now that many people have multiple cores on their machines, we want to use parallelization as much as possible. So here's the status. Uh, those of you that saw Lucas's talk just now had him say he thought he would be done by now when he proposed the talk six months ago. I'm in exactly the same position. I thought it would be done by now. Uh, real life, day job, remodeling our house, all, all kind of interfered with it. But we do have something. There's a V2 branch. 
I've written about 5,000 lines of code so far. Uh, it has vertex edge and face modes. Uh, the edge one doesn't do anything yet, but the, the face one is connected up to this straight skeleton algorithm that, that handles the collision. It's a bit buggy, but it is there. Uh, attribute propagation will happen later. One big thing that we're doing is working directly on mesh rather than convert into B mesh, operate there, and convert back. Uh, that required a whole bunch of code um, bases to get that to work, and that is there. Uh, the straight skeleton add-on was initially done by Henrik in Python, and uh, that avail you can use that as an add-on right now, but then I copied his Python code into C++ blindlib function called mesh inset uh, that is being used as a subroutine in this, in this node. And uh, Henrik has also done a Python prototype for smoothing that he'll talk about when we get to his part of the talk. So the, on the right is a screenshot to show there actually is a node. It does a face inset. Uh, you won't be seeing many more diagrams of what it's doing right now. And this, this is mainly a technical talk about why bevel is hard. Uh, so why is it hard? I mean, it's conceptually, it's this simple woodworking thing, right? You take a tool and, and shave a little bit off an edge, and you're done. That's a bevel. Um, and if you convert that into you know, a polygon mesh mode, uh, it means something like this. You take some edges, an edge that you want to bevel, you put some offset edges a set distance away from that original edge, then you remove all the material in the hole between those edges, and then you fill them up. That's a bevel. Now, there are a whole bunch of issues that, that I learned over the years is doing them. Some of them were immediately obvious. Some of them I only learned you know, through many bug reports. But I'm going to spend a lot of time now talking about these so that you can see that there's a lot of choices you have to make when implementing Bevel. Um, the first one is clear. You, you know, people have multiple edges that intersect. So when you remove the material, now you've got, it's unclear exactly how you fill this up, especially at that corner. Uh, the next one is a little less obvious when you first think about it, which is, you know, you don't bevel all the edges. There's non-beveled edges in between the beveled ones. And if they aren't in the same plane as those beveled edges, then when you do that edge offsetting, they don't match. They don't intersect. They, they cross skew in 3D. So there's no intersection point that's obvious to, to make the, for the bevel. Uh, you can do various things. What uh, bevel currently does is a compromise. It goes, takes the closest point of approach of those two lines, the midpoint. That's going to be the intersection point. Um, it kind of works, but it's not ideal. And there's a particular case that people want, uh, which violates that, which is the edge slide mode. So you, know, you can also decide to move the intersection to point along one of those existing non-beveled edges. And people like that, because it, it looks cool when you're, when you're beveling. It's the, at this point, it's just sliding along an edge. But it also maintains the silhouette of the object. If you rotate an object around, you don't get a, a distortion of the, the broad shape of the thing. Uh, but it causes lots of complications. You know, now, you know, the, the loop slide is shown on the bottom right. Uh, when you have loop slide on, the, the bevel widths are no longer what the user specified. They're different. And you, know, you kind of have to compromise exactly where this intersection point is. And it gets really hairy if you've got a closed loop of edges, all of which are beveled and loop slided. Um, when you come back, they don't match. So there's actually an optimization call inside of Bevel to, to solve the best compromise of dealing with loop slides. Uh, next issue is multiple segments on edges. Of course, we wanted this almost from the beginning of Bevel, uh, not just a single cutoff piece, but rather rounded edges. And you know, the obvious thing to do is say, oh, well, I'll take a quarter circle, divide it up into even chords, and that's the profile. Uh, First question that comes after that is, OK, what if you don't have edges meeting at a 90 degree angle? Uh, what Bevel currently does is takes that corner of, of angles that meet at 90 degrees and figures out the transformation matrix that maps it into this distorted corner where the edges are actually meeting at an angle, and then transforms that profile, that half circle, into, into the, the place in there. That kind of works. People haven't really complained about that too much, but people have asked for this other option, which is I would like a constant radius circle just sort of jammed into the corner and use whatever section of the arc you happen to get there. Uh, so I intend to give that option in Devil V2. I haven't done it yet, but it'll be there. Uh, next sort of variation on this issue is profiles that aren't just circles. Um, 
you know, there's these super ellipse profiles. And, you know, when, once you do this, you realize there's another math problem, which is how do I get even chord lengths on a super ellipse? There's no real easy formula to do that, I finally discovered. And so there's actually an iterative optimization in Bevel to do that, to figure out how do I get equal chord lengths along a super ellipse arc. Uh, and then there's a whole set of other issues to deal with custom profiles, which Hans could tell you about. I'm not going to get into them today. Uh, but the biggest issue probably at the beginning of doing Bevel was this hole filling problem. If you um, bevel these five edges that are going into the center in this object and then give it a five segment edge, uh, you get this funny pentagon with curved edges thing that you have to fill in somehow. How do you do that? I mean, if you go back to the principle of, oh, this is woodworking, you would try to maybe extend the edges along and intersect them. And it's, it's a horrible, horrible mess if you try to do that. You get gaps. I mean, you could probably use Boolean and, and, and get something that looked like something, but it would have weird, hard edges in it. It would be a mess that nobody would really want, uh, except in very special circumstances. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a PhD computer scientist, so I go off and read academic papers if I can. And believe it or not, there's a whole PhD thesis on how to do hole filling. Uh, and it seems like ev all the other DCC content have, you know, sort of discovered the same basic principle of how to fill, you know, more than three-sided holes, which is based on subdivision. The, the tricky part is uh, you have to match the curvature at those edges. Normally subdivision would, like, shrink inside if you did it. And the second tricky part is subdivision only gives you power of two number of segments, and we need arbitrary number of segments. Uh, so here's the, uh, an illustration of what the algorithm currently is in Bevel. It starts off with that you know, end gone for one segment. It uh, puts a, a uh, point in the middle and two points along each of the edges and joins them up. That's the first level of subdivision. And then it repeats that process. It's going to put a point in each of these things, divide each of the edges in two. And then there's some fiddly bits around the boundaries to try to match the curvature. That's the hard part here and why somebody wrote a thesis about this. Um, and so you get that one, and now you get that one, which is eight. But now we, w we only wanted five. What do you do? So you can overlay the five pattern on top of this and then snap to this surface. And that's what we do. So this is all kind of expensive to compute. Bevel pre-computes this at the beginning and then, and then uses that computation over and over again. So next. Uh, the next super hairy issue, and this has probably spent most of my development time on Bevel over the years, is UVs. There have been so many UV bug reports. Um, look at this case here. We have a, have a square, a cube. Uh, the top face is a, is a UV island shown on the left. Now, Bevel is going to put new points in that face. I've shown one here, and I've shown where in UV space you would interpolate that. So that's the obvious thing to do. Just every time you create a new face, see what point see what face it's over, interpolate on that face in UV space. Unfortunately, <laughs> this is what happens if you just use that algorithm. You, every time you're crossing an island in UV space, you know, the algorithm doesn't know you've crossed an island, it just draws these edges. You, you get this horrible mess. There may be some textures that would be okay with this mess, but I, I'm, I can assure you most users would file a bug report immediately if this is what we got out of out of the UV algorithm. So you can't do this. And the same problem happens not just crossing islands, but even crossing seams within the same island. Uh, so this is what the current bevel looks like. It, uh, the problem really only happens when you have an odd number of segments, and that middle segment, where do you put it? When you have an even number of segments, you just kind of evenly divide them in the two sides. It works OK. But that odd segment is the killer. What do you do about that? So I try to figure out consistently, okay, this is the island I'm going to put the middle segment on, and I, and I put that around. And then when I would want to have interpolated in a face in a completely different island or a different part of the island, I just snap to one of the edges and interpolate along that edge. So there's a lot of very careful bug-prone code that, that makes the correct snapping so that the previous thing doesn't happen again. Um, but it still has problems. Uh, there's open bug reports right now saying bevel is broken with UVs, and, and it's stuff like this. One of them is 
you know, these, these segments that you produce, depending on whether they were within the same island or across the seam, will have different widths. The same, the same thing in the objects, within the object space will have different width than UV space, so it kind of is distorted to users. Um, and then these corner polygons, because of the, the way I'm snapping the edges, um, will sometimes snap into the middle of an edge rather than what na seems natural to people, that it would be connected up to the other side. So these are long-standing problems that I don't really know how to fix with the current method of interpolating and snapping to edges. It feels to me like if I just look at the problem in UV space, I can do a better job. I haven't started on this yet, but I plan to do this. Then there's the issue of curvature matching. So, uh, you know, that super ellipse formula, it, uh, if you look at the math of what it's going to do to the second derivative, you can show that you're guaranteed not to get continuity. So you see these visible ar artifacts here where the, the faces join. No matter how many segments you put in this thing, there'll be this visible line there. Ideally, that line wouldn't be there. Uh, Henrik has an idea that he'll talk about later to solve that problem. And then finally, just coming back to collisions, I teased about this at the beginning, but I just wanted to give another motivation, which is bevel after Boolean. A lot of people would like bevel after Boolean because after you Boolean, you, in real life, there's often a fillet around where, those, where the join happens, and you'd like to bevel to make that fillet apparent. Uh, but in our world of, of mesh, soon what happens is that nasty clamp thing says, I can't bevel anymore. You know, and often it's a really tiny amount that you can bevel before that happens. If you try to bevel over that, you get an unholy mess that nobody wants. Uh, so I've been promising for two years to fix this problem. There's a, an add-on that kind of does bevel after Boolean, but it does it by um, like intersecting a pipe around this. It, it has only limited application. Like it won't work for more than two edges going into, into a, a seam. Uh, anyway, the, the straight edge skeleton algorithm We'll solve this problem too if we if we work on it hard enough. We have to you have to do, be careful about ha what happens as it flows over existing geometry. But I'm sure we can make this work. Um, the solution is is this straight skeleton algorithm, and I'm now going to pass over the second half of this talk to Henrik. He's going to talk about that and curvature matching. Yeah, thanks. Um, so to fix this mess, we looked at the uh, few solutions and the best one was the straight skeleton. So um, to do that, let's look at the bevel process again. So this is a basic process. We start at some mesh, like a cube here. Um, then we split up all the edges which we want to bevel. Then, uh, and we also keep in mind which vertices go together. Then um, we do some post-processing for the meters. Um, then we add the profiles, and then we close the vertex holes. So the problem with bevel after, uh, yeah, bevel after Boolean um, appears directly in the first step. So these first polygons, they um, often self-intersect and are not simple polygons anymore. Um, so that's the step where we want to introduce our new algorithm. So this is an, an example of um, what should happen. So we are beveling these, these top edges um, around the top face, not the inner one. And for small bevels, this is what the current bevel produces and it's the, one, the thing you would expect. And then for larger bevels, it's a little bit more difficult to think about what we would expect. So one thing we might uh, expect is this uh, thing where basically if you think about it with woodworking, you are taking off this one edge and then you are taking off it from a different angle and then it cuts into this one edge. So you get this little dip there. So the, the top uh, face would not longer be one face, but now two faces. So this could be one. Um, expected result. So how would we do that? Um, this is exactly the straight skeleton and nature has a solution for that as well. So this is the crystal um, or mineral. I don't really know geology. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
uh, I thought it looked pretty. And yeah, basically it grows from the outside. So that's exactly what we want in bevel as well. And then you get all this, these intricate patterns. And uh, so let's, let's look a little bit more into crystal growth. So here I've just done some, some crystals from, from a circle. And now let's have a think about how we would grow them, how we would uh, make an animation of how they grow. So the first thing um, you can think of is obviously you just take the crystals and scale them up, right? Just animate the scale and then it would look like if it was growing. But um, then we get to this point and you can see that at this point the scaling would not lo no longer work because of these points, their intersections, and if one crystal crashes into the other, then the one which was at the intersection point first will just keep growing and the other one is blocked. So if you just would, would scale the crystals, then it would point through, so that would not work. Um, yeah, also one thing that, which is not shown here, but if they arrive at the point at the same time, they would actually create a new direction of growth. So um, that's another complication in the algorithm and it's actually causing big trouble. <laughs> and then it would keep growing and at some point be like this. So no more changes when it keeps growing, it just keeps growing out of this dish. And uh, this is actually the only geometry which I've shown you in this past three slides. It's just I take this geometry, put a plane through it, and move it. So that's a crystal growth. I can just go back again. Yeah. Um, okay. So now back to here. Um, this is exactly what I have done here to the to the right large bevel. I've just used this crystal growth algorithm and just didn't fully grow it, cut it off at some point, and that is what you get. Of course, um, if you do very large bevels, so at some point these phases would become a point, and then if you increase the bevel even more, it would just shrink. It would just shrink this whole object, just cut it off more and more. So if you think about wood cutting, it's just cutting it off. So. That might be what we want, might not be. Let's um, look at a different case. Um, because what we have seen in the previous slide was really a special case. We have all um, edges which were um, convex. So here we have the same shape, but two of the edges are concave and two of them are con convex. And yeah, for small bevels, again, this is just the current bevel, it works. But then for large bevels, at some point, they will crash into one another, and then we have to somehow handle it. So the most reasonable way I thought of um, is to just stop the vertex when it hits the other one, just stop it there and not handle it anymore. So that gets us um, this right result there. Um, but it's, of course, very different from the thing on the previous slide here. So. Um, we need to think about it again, right? So um, now the next thing is um, segments. So you can add segments to that and it works here, right? Because it's still just quads and you can just put the segments in there. Um, but note that we have this, uh, this edge here. Uh, I can point like this. And it is really what's making this possible. So if we remove that edge, then we get this result. So it still works for the small bevel, but for, for the large bevel, um, we get these edges here, which just don't care about this indent here. So we get this overlapping geometry again, which we try to avoid. So we need to address that as well by adding um, segments adding segments like this. 
and that can be done with a straight skeleton, but um, it will not always work. It will probably work for all cases which you will ever try, but yeah. <laughs> so that can be done, um, it will need to be done. And now the issue is we have these two approaches. So one of them is um, for beveling this convex geometry, and one of them is for beveling a real surface, the thing you would um, encounter in, in real life. And uh, now we need to find some kind of compromise or something which uh, works for all cases, right? So my solution was to just say we always use the second approach. So that would make this geometry look like this. So basically just if it hits, um, stop it there and don't let it um, move down. And that will cause these uh, a little bit weird geometry, but I mean, you can think of it as some variable width bevels. So just clamping, but not with one value, but for every point, different value. Yeah. Then there's, of course, the issue of non-planar -plan cases, these uh, straight skeleton um, algorithms, which are online available as papers. They all work in 2D, and it's very difficult to extend that to um, the 3D case. So this is what it currently looks like. Um, I've just implemented it as, uh, think about it as 2D locally, and then this happens. Um, which is fine, I guess, but uh, I mean, you would probably want to have something better. And it's pos uh, probably possible to improve it, but it's very, 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 very difficult. So then the next issue, which I wanted to talk about, is uh, um, vertex hole filling. Um, and specifically, it's about the vertex holes. So the profiles, their continuity, it will always be um, set by the, the profile. So if you have a circular profile, it will always be only, so it will have a jump in curvature because one is a circle and one is a flat plane, so different curvature. Um, that's, that's not the problem here. The problem is the continuity here at this edge. And then inside here, we want to have something as smooth as possible. We don't want to have it stick out somehow, um, all these issues. And yeah, so we know what we want. We know we want curvature continuity. We want that it is smooth. Um, but it's very difficult to find a formula for that. So you can't just have a single formula which says, um, this is the surface, this is the points where you should put the points, right? Um, so to solve this, uh, we use optimizers because we want, we know what we want. So use an optimizer to find that solution. Um, this can be slow, can be fast. We don't know yet um, if it will be fast enough, but maybe um, because we can do it with a linear optimizer. So basically just inverting a matrix, and these are the results. So on the left, we can see the current results. This is here um, a patch, and here's another patch. And at the borders, we can see with this um, mat cap that there is these weird um, corners and stuff. So to have curvature continuity, it should look like this um, here inside. And then, of course, at the boundary here, it's again circle to plane, so there will be no curvature continuity there. Yeah, But this is the result we get, and what I've used for this is take the sec second Laplacian of the surface and then just set that to zero, and that's the linear equation that you can solve. Um, yeah, and solving it gives you all the positions, so we don't even need to start at a good um, initial condition. You it just uh, calculates the inverse of a matrix. And here are some examples. So this is um, the old ver vertex hole filling. And then if you apply the smoothing, then this is how it looks. So in the old one, you can obviously see the corners, uh, the, the edges. And in the new one, it's very smooth. 
um, it doesn't carry the profile through it. That's a little bit of an issue, I guess. For some um, special cases, we could carry the profile through it, but um, that would be not solvable like this. So that would need um, special case handling. Uh, here's another um, application of this same thing. So you can just um, change a few vertices and then get an area and smooth it, and it will have all the boundary con um, boundary continuity. So it will make a surface which very well fits the or original mesh. So basically, I just pulled with proportional editing on the monkey and then applied this, and this is the result. And it's very close to the original, actually. And the reason why we are using this optimizer instead of some formulas, um, well, of course, we don't know the formulas, but maybe for the square case, there could be formulas. But we have actually poles inside, so that makes it much more difficult. And the optimizer works with the poles as well. So this is one example of the straight skeleton now, um, applied to text. So this is the inset, and this is this is the second mode. So we have the bevel, the bevel with the straight skeleton, which we'll use it to clamp, but um, we also want to use it for the inset, and then you can do this stuff with the inset instead of the bevel. So. Uh, yeah, that would be possible. Um, and this worked right away, but um, oftentimes there is epsilons in this algorithm and sometimes it still doesn't work, so there's still work to be done. It's similar to Boolean in some way. So, yeah. But here it worked, so. Great. Yeah, and this is another example, so Again, just this straight skeleton inset, and it's lifted as well. So I can use, use a height for a color ramp, and then I recreated the crystal <laughs> somewhat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then there's just one more example for me that, that thing that I showed at the very beginning the piece of the serif on the A. This, the node will do this. If you try to go a little bit further, it hits a bug. So. <laughs> Definitely not ready for use yet, but you know, progress is advancing. And that's that's it for our talk, I guess. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we have time for questions. If okay. Yeah. Sure. So you mentioned this, like healing Suzanne thing. Is that part like? code to do this sort of boundary condition solving to like plan to make a separate node as well if you think it's useful or maybe a tool in edit mode I would think yeah currently it's just a python script so I can just run it and then you know see the result but uh, it also currently doesn't work for all patches so it needs certain topology as a boundary so maybe that needs to be improved if we there's a Laplacian smooth modifier that yeah. I did the summer of code mentoring for. Uh, we should look to see if that's you know the similar thing and whether we should merge this or use this code in there. Right. Yeah. And for uh, you guys showed up two two examples. One with uh, where we collapse into the edge, and then there's the second one where we can overlap the the, ed the edges together. And what are the expectation for the speed of that? Will it be much slower or can it be like similar to what we have currently with, with modifiers? I think it'll be slower, but you know, we'll have to see whether it's so slow that I have to actually kind of implement the old way too and switch only when there's a collision or whether this will be fast enough. I mean, we're trying to, I'm trying to use algorithms that are not quadratic, they're, they're, but, but setting up the data structures takes some time. I mean, my hope is it's going to be fast enough, but we won't know until it's completely implemented. And you know, it depends on, of course, on just how huge your model is and how many things you're bubbling. But. Yeah. Uh, what kind of timelines are you envisaging for having a usable product in the master budget? 
Uh, realistically, this is probably another six months of work, I'm afraid. I, uh, you know, I have a, a day job and so it's, yeah. it's, this is quite complicated. There's still some big unknowns, especially in the UV handling and especially in the, as Henry was talking good. about, the actual adapting this to multi-segment edges. Um, we know that in principle the straight algorithm, skeleton algorithm does what we want, but then turning that into practice, I think it's going to be a bunch of work. So what I typically do on complicated algorithms, and I do this on Boolean, is I make um, a programmatic test case that, that I can make bigger and bigger, you know, like a UV sphere that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Or maybe I'll take maybe two UV spheres and, and intersect them, and uh, you know, I can do something similar here, at, you know, something that will have a scalable number of vertices, and then I can run uh, profile timing on it to see how it's doing. Of course, I'm paying big attention to what algorithms I'm using in the first place to make sure that, you know, in no case am I really having an algorithm that goes over, say, all the vertices of, of a face over and over again in case you had a huge face. Thomas? Uh, yeah, in terms of UV, I'm sure there's a lot of difference between the systems, but what UV could be that's suggested, and I'm sure there's like a bias for inclusion in different answers. How do you guys gauge that? Yeah, you, the UVs and, and artist connection is something I hadn't paid enough attention to when I originally did it. You know, I, I had made this assumption that the way you use UVs is you you have, let's say, a painting that is that you've done inside the UV lines in, in the UV space, and that it was imperative to stay inside the existing lines. So all the code is trying very hard to stay inside the existing usage of the UV space and not have them overlap each other. Right? That, is, that is important for one use case of, of artists, but there's other use cases of artists um, where that isn't important at all. Right? Staying inside, it's like when you have a, a sort of general texture covering the whole area. Um, maybe the orientation of the UVs matters, but the actual overlapping doesn't really matter. And, and so, I, I think there may have to be options to, to account for these different ways that people care about what happens in UV space because there's compromises that get made. Like if you stay inside the lines, maybe you can't avoid distortion. Whereas if you go outside the lines, maybe you can get a lot closer to not having distortion. And, and one of those things may be more important than the other to the artist. I don't know. I'd, I'd certainly welcome more feedback on, on that particular point. I don't really know what people want to have happen. I mean. It is a big messy thing and obviously because this is a node, nobody wants to have to manually fix the UVs after the bevel. It, it sort of makes this a, a no-go use case. So it really has to work automatically and do what people want and that, that's another thing that makes it really hard. I mean, a lot of the bugs have been in the form of, oh, you chose the wrong islands for these two pieces and now if I look at, I've used it for colors. The, this, this segment is blue and the next one is red and you know like they don't match up. It doesn't look aesthetically nice. And so there's a lot of tie-breaking rules in, in the code right now to try to make it so that it'll look kind of uniform, the choice of the island. And, uh, but maybe, maybe those tie-breaking rules are wrong. Like there's assumptions, oh, you'd prefer them, the islands to be at the top or the bottom, say, rather than on the sides. It's not easy. Yes, Aris. Speaking about UVs, you also mentioned that when the number of segments is even, it's kind of a lesser problem if you cross a UV seam or UV island. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking, if, couldn't it also be like an option that, you know, if you specify an odd number of segments, but if these happen to cross a seam, then it automatically picks the next even number of segments. So it's what you have to do with this. Uh, I mean, it, it, this feels like a user choice that isn't too hard. If they know it, it's messy with odd. I mean, maybe, yeah, users who don't know very much about what, what's going on inside and don't know that odd thing, that would be a sort of dumb user kind of a facility that, that could be enabled by it. But 
unless you're talking about something more sophisticated where you use the number, you, you use the even thing and then try to fix the UV space based on what happens on the, on the no, even. No, I'm thinking uh, only promote the number of segments to even if you cross the UVC. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, so have a variable number of segments yeah, depending yeah. on what's happening. It's an interesting idea. What do people think about that? I don't know. Okay, it can then lead to what feels non-uniformity in looking at your model, where the number of segments is varying. If it's a small, a large number of segments, you certainly wouldn't notice it. Yeah, would be generally fine. you would try to avoid UV seams in the first place because they just go all over them. So, so hopefully that would only, you know, uh, as far as I know, people, you know, artists tend to avoid UV seams or put them into less visible places of the model anyway because of all the issues. That note for odd segments, you could do maybe it's not the best solution, but you could do another cut in the middle for odd segments to keep the UVs at the original borders. Yeah, that's kind of what he's talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there are other problems with that as well. So, if you shrink your bevel into the face, then maybe you cross a UV seam as well. So, and then it doesn't work as well. Yeah, yeah the, the bevel after Boolean thing is now going to have these these things going over multiple faces and you'll be in a whole different area of UV space. Just stop using UV everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Someone over there had a question. Yes, yeah, so I've noticed that the general approach of, of uh, getting the bevel work is to perform an edge split and then uh, dealing with the hosting of the edges and creating some curve in the middle. Uh, are there any like, alternative approaches to this? Uh, like maybe uh, creating show me in a diagram what you're talking about. I don't, I don't really know. I, I mean, the, there's a big paradigm shift to using edge skeleton that's going to happen, which is right now, you kind of like bevel each edge independently or, or only with its neighbor. Whereas what's happening with, with this new thing is that you have to find the contours of edges that go around in a closed loop and join up to each other. That then forms a wave front that you expand out until they hit other wave fronts. And, uh, you know, so this is, is going to be in a different organization of the code. It's also going to make it harder to parallelize because you don't really know the extent of the globality of the, of, of, of the islands that you all have to consider together because they might, might bash into each other. Another thing that we didn't have time, actually, looks like we did have time, but to show that gets complicated is, um, you know, one big benefit of straight skeleton is that it joins those, merges those edges as they come together. But there's another thing that happens, which is if you have a reflex edge, a uh, reflex corner, uh, it, it'll eventually hit the advancing opposite edge and sort of, you know, it'll actually you know, hit that other edge. And when that happens, it splits into two separate faces. Yeah, that's... And, uh, yeah, he had an example that you may not have noticed, but it splits into two separate faces. And you get that one. Yeah, you get. Um, you know, this is ideal for things like if you're trying to raise roofs and have a nice, you know, corner, a constant slope on the roofs, and and have the right thing happen if if two peaks should form. Um, it's a pretty cool thing, but it, it means the algorithm is is kind of complicated. The biggest complications of the algorithm, honestly, though, are as Henrik was talking about, all the special cases that happen when things happen simultaneously. If you only ever have one collision happen at a time, it's, it's all easy. You can write the code. It's, it's, it's when you, you know, take a square and, and inset them simultaneously, all of a sudden you get like several things happen at once. And, and making the algorithm work properly there is hairy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yes? Using geometry notes, I'm not aware currently of a way of feeding in um, edge weights for specifically I mean, I, I have to talk more with, the, <laughs> with these guys over here about how exactly I want to have the, the inputs controlled. When I've been doing my tests right now, I just, I just take an index, uh, an index node and then a, a comparison node against a particular value so that I can index, I can bevel the thing I want to bevel. 
you can imagine formulaic ways of doing that same thing. The, the selection input into the node is, is going to give a per element, if you're in edge mode, a per edge Boolean saying, I want this one beveled, I want that one beveled, whatever. There will also be uh, a field called weight that you can either leave blank and then it'll be the same weight for all the edges or you can, it can be a, a per edge of the whole mesh uh, field that, uh, that then lets you feed in whatever weight you want per edge. I mean, there's a, I kind of hinted at this, but there's, there's a redundancy when you do that, especially if you want to allow each corner to have its own width, because then, then you get conflicts, like you can't have this corner and the adjacent corner have these two widths and have them meet. So the, the non-redundant way of specifying this would be to say, at each corner, you say, okay, here's a vector that I want the intersection point to move along, and here's a length I want it to move along that. That's sort of the internal way where we would like to represent things. That seems a very unartistic way to have as, a, as an input into this node. And uh, you know, we've, been, we've been discussing some possibilities of making that the node and then having another node that prepares a more artistic friendly way of specifying a bevel into that node. Uh, at the moment, I'm leaning more towards just having both of those possibilities in, in the code. I think vertex weight, sorry, um, weight, bevel, and sorry, edge, edge weights, for me, I, I tend to use the Boolean values anyway, so just yeah. having that capability would just be fantastic. Yeah, you can have Boolean. The, yeah. You know, bevel weights, both on vertices and edges, are, are these weird extra attributes of mesh that don't really belong where they are. They were added in, in you know, in some weird way as first-class citizens of those elements. They, they in no way should ever have been that. And I know Hans has been, you know, working on rationalizing how attributes are stored on meshes. And I'm sure he would like those to go away. And that, <laughs> that the way you would control Bevel is you make up your own custom attribute that you then assign somehow uh, to edges. That would be the equivalent of Bevel weights. Yes. Uh, what are the areas that this problem can be paralyzed? Uh, because there are a lot of overlapping sub problems. So yeah. Any idea how we are going to I mean, it? The, f the first and, and easiest thing to parallelize is there's a, a place where at the beginning you have to figure out what is the ordering of edges and faces around each vertex that's involved in a bevel. Because that isn't naturally uh, part of the mesh data structure. You can trivially parallelize that work across all vertices together. Um, if you're doing a vertex bevel, the whole vertex bevel can probably be done if you're not worrying about letting it expand over adjacent edges. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm going to allow that or not yet. Uh, for edge bevel, it gets harder. I, you know, if you assume that, that things aren't going to crash into each other, you can kind of you know, parallelize a lot of things. But, once you, there may have to be this stage where I, I make clusters of stuff that I think are independent problems and then paralyze over those independent problems. It's not going to be easy. Yeah. Yeah. Have you considered doing a, a bit like for a Boolean, there's like a fast one and a slow one. Have you considered doing like a switch where if you wanted a simple case, a small bevel case that it could be? Yeah. A separate thing. If you want to do the more advanced thing, you happily pay for that. That's possible. I may have to do that if the speed of the other one is too slow. I really hope to avoid that. I mean, that seems like an annoying thing to make a user have to think about and worry about. I mean, the more ideal thing, if, if, if it comes to that, is the calculation to figure out whether things are going to intersect is not too hard. The current code does that uh, in, the, in the clamp bevel mode. So I could, I haven't done it yet, but I could put that calculation back in there and then first do a global evaluation. Of, are there any intersections at all? If not, then use the old, old method of beveling. If so, then use this new method. But maybe, I mean, if, if they do overlap, I mean, I, I don't think there's much use in allowing people to use the old method. It's, it, it's so icky. The, the results. I guess the only thing reason I can see you doing that is if you're willing then to manually clean it up because it's basically 
unusable in most cases when that overlap starts happening. Yeah, and also the straight skeleton um, only computes the stuff that you actually want in the end, so it doesn't compute the complete straight skeleton, but just the stuff where the collisions ha happen. So in case you don't have collisions, then it doesn't do much. So actually, performance-wise, it's quite fine then. Okay, I guess we're out of time now. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you.